This is the moment we've all been waiting for. For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. Welcome to In or Out, a rapid-fire game where we discuss a handful of topics and determine where we stand. On today's episode, we are going to break down some of the things that happened in an electric Game 5 between the Orlando Magic and Cleveland Cavaliers. Joining me to work through this are my two co-hosts, Jackson Flickinger and Corey Walsh. And let's start here. Max Struess has worked all season to prove that he can be more than just a shooter, but let's face it, he was brought here to do one thing, and that shoot the three-pointer. Struess has struggled throughout the series, but he did have a big game five, drilling four key three-pointers and a big one down the stretch. Jackson and Corey, are you in or out on this being a turning point in the series for Max Struess? Um, neither. I, I hope this is a turning point for Max, but the thing that I liked is that he took 10 three-pointers, which isn't something that we've mm. seen. Um, throughout the series, I think obviously having a ton more spacing out there when you just have one big really helps in this department. And I think he was really uh, aggressive and looking for his shot uh, in game five, but he was brought in here to shoot and he needs to have games where he's taking 10 threes, because if he's not taking 10 threes, then we've, we've gone over that he's a more complete basketball player than I think many thought of. Uh, last mm-hmm. summer when the Cavs signed him, but he he needs to shoot, and this is this is what you need from him. This is like ten three point attempts. Like obviously, not every game gonna have ten three point attempts, but at least eight. I think is kind of what you want to see from Max Drew. So this is what he was brought in to do. He did it in Game Five. It'd be nice if he did it more than one time in a series. So hopefully, he's able to do that next game. I would say that I think he more found his lane and how he can impact this series because his shot profile became much more diverse in this game than it really has throughout the Orlando stretch. We were seeing him attack the basket. There were design plays for him to attack the basket off of uh, picks and sets. But overall, uh, I just feel like you can't really think after the season we've seen from Max Struess that this game is going to be like the turning point because it feels like he never really got his legs under him this season. And his shots just became more and more refined or uh, simplified as the season went along. We hinted at that in prior episodes that his movement shooting has gone way down and became a stationary shooter. And it felt like this was more of a return to the beginning of the season. But I wouldn't say a one game sample size is enough for me to think that Max Struess is back to the player we thought we were getting in the off season. Mm. And the streakiness is kind of just who he is as well. It's kind of just how his game goes. He really is like the embodiment of those players who just need to see one go in. Uh, he can get hot so quickly. I think we saw this game where he hits that pull up and then all of a sudden he's t- he's every time he gets the ball with a little bit of daylight, even if he doesn't have daylight, that bomb he hit in the third quarter, draped all over him, didn't matter. Uh, Struess, I said this, I think, on the last episode. If you're comparing him to, like, Niang, for example, I trust that Struess will be able to find his way out of a slump more than, I think, most role players, uh, just because he has proven that he can handle the heat in the playoffs. He can rise to the occasion. I know people will focus on his three-point percentage, but he had some huge games last year for the heat in the playoffs. He was a big reason they made it to the finals, and so I hope he has a few more big games in him. I do also want... Oh, Jackson, please. No, no. no. Well, he like you just need him to shoot. And that's kind of what we saw this game is that he's shooting. And when he's shooting, he can get hot. You can't get hot if you're not shooting. And I think that's kind of where the frustration has been at various points in this series. And he I think to the movement point that uh, Corey brought up, it's playing with just one big allows so much more room and so much more freedom on the court to really do more things besides just, okay, space in the corner because we're running a high pick and roll to your side. And that's where I think Max really uh, shined through in this game. And I, and obviously for him to, for the Cavs to be good when Allen is out, they need this version of Max. I also thought he did a really good job on the glass The Mm -hmm. Cavs rebounded very well when he was out there on the floor. They didn't rebound nearly as well without him on the floor. So that's something to also keep in mind. And that's where 
when we talk about Max being more of a complete basketball player, this is what we're talking about, where he allows you to do more versatile things with your lineup. And I think this was a good example of that. Versatility is not something that Tony's uh, lamp knows a lot about, but uh, it's good that Super Max versatile. does. Yeah. It knows how to change through all the settings for no reason whatsoever. Uh, but you're right. To, to that point you were making on the glass, uh, the Cavalier starters, all five of them had four or more rebounds. That's the first time that's happened in the playoffs dating back to last year. And honestly, a good way to transition to talking about what it's like with one big on the floor, because with the news that Jared Allen would be out with a rib injury, Jackson received his monkey paw wish of Evan Mobley being tossed into the fire to play center full time. Uh, Mobley had a tall task ahead of him. It's a sizable Orlando Magic team. So, Jackson, are you in or out on what we saw from Mobley? I am in. I'm not necessarily in on, yes, let's, like, Mobley should be the starting center for every game in the playoffs Mm -hmm. from here on out. Uh, Obviously, without Allen, uh, yes, he should be. But, you know, I think this really showed that Mobley is a lot more versatile in what he can do when given the opportunity to do so. And I think... Like, I just think that he would be a more well-rounded player if the Cavs, right after drafting him, maybe, like, we're going to play you at power forward for November, December, but January, or, like, after the all-star break of your rookie year, you're going to be the center, and you're just going to have to sink or swim. I think that would have been much more beneficial for him long-term. But today, not today, uh, yesterday for Game 5, he really showed how, like, he can be ready for that even if it's been even if it was a little i don't know how to like say this the best way like it wasn't a perfect game but it was definitely good enough and it was he 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 held up to the playoff pressure yeah it feels like he had like the key moments at the end of the uh the end of the fourth quarter that you can leave that game knowing that there is something that you could build on going forward it felt like during stretches and this could also just be in part because the Cavs literally had to throw Tristan Thompson's corpse out there to relieve him in minutes but the Cavs really didn't go into the postseason really thinking of who their backup plan would be of one of the bigs really got injured i mean it was uh just a, a mishmash of players thrown together to try to cobble minutes so mobley can get time off and mobley defensively definitely looked like he was huffing at times in the third quarter he he is probably one of the quickest players to look drenched in sweat i've ever seen in my life i noticed <laughs> like, that literally dude. i think it was like the first time the ball went out of bounds the camera was on mobley and just drops of sweat were coming off i was like dude game started two minutes ago <laughs> I, no there's no one to back you up <laughs> I know. And then it's just the Cavs are really for a team that has two seven footers. You think of the Cavs kind of as like a taller team. But in reality, they're a really short roster. So they would get demolished on the boards by the magic because you can just see when they bring off their bench players. They still have tall players coming off their bench too. Jonathan Isaac is a menace on the glass. And thank God the Cavs team rebounded to cover that fact that Mobley was really the only player who could contest with the magic on most of those rebounds considering the size they have but even like Mobley's not the strongest rebounder himself at most times so it's definitely a good trial by fire for Mobley and I'm glad that a lesson also resulted in a win but I don't think the Cavs are going to change the form formula of the series by playing Mobley at the five going forward Hmm. yeah I agree with that you you got to hope Jared Allen will be back. He was a game time decision. So that could mean he's back next game or he's going to be out for two months. Yeah. Uh, we just, we never know. Uh, regardless, I, I, I do have something to say. One on that. thing to say on that, like they said, he's going to go through pregame warmups and then we'll decide. He never went through pregame warmups. He wasn't mm-hmm. out there at all. So I don't, I think that was kind of BS. So I feel like he was out the whole day. So I don't, I'm not super optimistic that he's going to be mm-hmm. playing next game, but, you know, fingers yeah. crossed. Well, regardless, it was announced like 20 minutes before right. tip-off. So I guess, as I was saying, like, we don't really know. Uh, I guess we'll mm-hmm. find out. Hopefully, uh, Allen's available because things are just a lot easier when you have him out there. But regardless, Mobley had a challenge in front of him, and I, I think that was the best game of his playoff career. Not that the bar is exactly super high, but I thought he had a huge impact. Um, now he struggled at times, especially in the third quarter, the Cavs guards, I wanted to hit on this point. They just kept throwing grenades to him. Like they would get downhill the Orlando's in drop. So the floater or the mid range shot, or even the layup is open. 
And then rather than taking it, Garland or Mitchell just throw a laser bullet pass to him point blank. And Moby had a hard time catching them. It's it's mm-hmm. difficult to catch those passes. You're throwing them full heat right at him. He's getting ready to box out and go for the rebound. And you're just tossing a grenade to him. And so he had a lot of plays where he bobbled the ball. He got blocked a few times down there. So that was a little rough, but he picked it up big time down the stretch. His defense on Bancaro was just otherworldly. Uh, the block on Wagner, incredible, incredible rotation and recovery to get there. Um, and also just the confidence and poise at the end of games, at the end of the game to catch those grenades and finish at the rim when the Cavs really needed him, that dunk. And then that layup at the end, just two, a, a huge two way performance from Mobley when you needed it the most. One of the things that I think is really important to look at for especially young bigs is how they hold up over as the game goes on, especially a physical game like this. And Mobley played about 40 minutes, and the 40th minute that he played was his best minute, which is a super encouraging sign. Mm -hmm. It's really what you want to see. And one of the things that I think was really good, and I think an area that Mobley, like, struggles with is I think he overcommits sometimes to blocks. Like, he doesn't, it doesn't end up in fouls, but I think he gets a little bit out of position sometimes when he's being the help defender, which allows those offensive rebounds. And I think game five showed that when he's playing center, he can be a lot more disciplined and still be like the shot blocker that he has always shown he can be, but be a disciplined shot blocker where he's still able to allow his team to get rebounds. Even when he's not getting the rebound, his, his, uh, block, his, uh, boxing out really allowed the, you know, the other starters to get boards as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Moving into our next topic, J.B. Bickerstaff did the unthinkable by yanking George Niang out of the rotation entirely in Game 5. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody thought that, uh, you know, George Niang would be reserved to a bench roll. I'm kidding, obviously. Everyone has been hoping this would happen for a very long time. Uh, In his place, Marcus Morris, in my opinion, stepped up in a big way. We'll start with Corey. Are you in or out on Morris being the full-time Niang replacement moving forward? And I'm focusing mainly on Niang because obviously if Wade or any other person was available, would you be playing Morris? Probably not. But as far as that goes, do you want Morris to be the full-time Niang replacement? I think this game alone is the one game sample size I need to know that I'd rather have Morris be in the rotation. And it's not like necessarily from the knee jerk reaction. You're just seeing the other facets that Morris can bring to the game, even if it's not the version that would be normally passable for postseason. Like this could have easily been his peak performance in this postseason, but we haven't seen anything similar to this in Niang. Like the most we could say about Niang in the last four games was, wow, the defense he played on Boncaro was surprisingly solid. And then you move on because the shot was at like nine percent through four games mm-hmm. morris comes in he spreads the floor he takes the shots that you don't yell at your tv being like why are you pulling up from here you're clearly missed your first five just move on he has like the wherewithal to know that he's playing within the system and he might not necessarily be the system <laughs> and overall he really especially with the mobley lineup he really helps the geometry on the court because the spacing he provides allows mobley to be in those positions And even though Niang theoretically does the same thing, Niang wasn't hitting shots. So Orlando was kind of just allowing him to keep hucking it up. And he was going to continue to do so because we learned through 82 games that Niang doesn't really seem to read the room that well. So, yeah, I'm all in on the uh, Morris swap for Niang. One thing that I will say that Morris brought is he's a much better defensive rebounder than Niang and that's super helpful in a series like this especially without Allen where rebounding is a premium so I think that's an area that if you were just going to base it on one thing alone I would just say like just his rebounding ability is makes him more valuable than Niang in this series one thing I will caution on is that I feel like veterans especially like veterans later in their career they can have games where they look like their former self where they you know like this was a marcus morris game from five years ago six years ago like he looked like that guy just because he looked like that guy one game doesn't mean to look like that guy at all the next game but i would still keep him in 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 the rotation just because of his his uh, rebounding yeah i i would definitely agree with that i think that's where the experience matters and you were talking with Mm -hmm. mobley how sometimes he can rotate too far over for a block on that block that we saw from Mobley at the end of the game, 
it's Marcus Morris staying home, boxing out his man when he very easily could have saw that because Mobley got beat off the dribble. It was a recovery mm-hmm. and, and great rejection from Mobley, which everyone except Coach Nick saw coming. B-ball breakdown is the only one who's surprised <laughs> by that. But, uh, Marcus Morris easily could have stepped over and tried to stop that, but he trusted Mobley. He trusted his freakish defensive teammate, stayed home, boxed out. And I don't think he grabbed the rebound himself, but they don't get the rebound if he doesn't box out right there. So I think the experience matters. I think Morris, while he's not as prolific of a three-point shooter as Niang, he gives you basically the same stuff. I just think he's more reliable. And by that, I mean, I don't think he's going to break the game as much as Niang can when he's not playing uh, very well. And I think his presence just calmed everyone down. I think we need to check the credentials on this coach Nick guy. Like, <laughs> what is he ever the like a coach of? Can you just call yourself a coach? You know, like he's Maybe. certainly not coaching, and some of the some well, of his takes have always been pretty bad. There's a, re- so, there's a reason he's not coaching anymore. If you're not aware, right. I'll let the fans can look that up for themselves. Just, just in. Search why B-Ball Breakdown was fired from his coaching right. job. And it's not like, nope. you know, former <laughs> announcers, you know, they're not like, you know, Jeff Van Gundy. Coach Jeff, what do you think about the, you know, mm. the Pacers yeah. play in the first half? Like, that, they don't do that. So that's, you know, I I want to call that out. <laughs> I think all we learned from mainstream, like, media, like, first take-esque is if you shout loud enough, people are entertained. And from all the highlights I see of his video breakdowns, the dude doesn't go past the 10 octave almost ever. <laughs> no, I, just I, think that's the, I think that's the other guy oh, that you're thinking yeah, of. Yeah, you might be. You might be the yelling guy. guy. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so embarrassed. Not B-ball breakdown. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. B-ball breakdown's been in it for a while. Uh, yeah, the, the awful coaching, I think, is the name of the guy you're thinking of. He's, yeah, I think, he's a little he's, newer. He's just screaming the whole time. Yeah, we yeah, could maybe. do a whole episode uh, talking about these guys. I'll see myself up. <laughs> Big fan okay. over here. It's okay. Tony's not editing this one, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've already established there will be no editing for this episode. Uh, Thank God. <laughs> I'll look really good in this edit. <laughs> well, since we're just keeping this going for our next topic, let's discuss a player who maybe could have used some editing this season. Uh, Darius Garland. It's been a brutal year for DG. Uh, and as he put it after the game himself, everyone has been on his ass about the way he's playing uh, and kind of for good reason. So to see DG respond with, I would say the second best playoff game of his career game two against the Knicks being number one, that was reassuring. Uh, he showed the heart and aggression that we've been begging to see. So I'll ask the question, Are you in or out on DG showing just a little bit of dog in him? Just the tiniest bit of dog. If you're asking if I think that he has dog in him now, that's, that's a, I'm out on that. (laughs) Just because this is like, this shouldn't be the exception. Like if Karis LeVert had a 17 point quarter, we would definitely be patting him on the head and acting like it's found money and just saying, oh, wow. Like Karis LeVert, like he really stepped up. They wouldn't have won this game without him. But we're talking about Darius Garland. He's, you know, obviously 17 points in a quarter is out of the realm of, like, he can do this every game. But he should be stepping up like this and being assertive like this. He should be looking for his shot like this, especially when Donovan Mitchell is as hobbled as he is. So, like, I don't want to... I feel like if you praise him too much, like, not that it matters, but it feels like you're saying you don't expect this out of him. And it's like, we should expect a 23 point performance in the playoffs out of him. This isn't, you know, he's not a role player. He's, he's a core piece of this team. And he's somebody who needs to step up when Jalen Suggs is just doing an amazing job on staying with Donovan Mitchell. And he's as hobbled as he is. So like, yes, this was a really good performance. It was much needed, but this needs to be not the exception. Yeah. And I don't disagree with you, but I, I do expect this out of DG. And so that's why I was, I was glad it's reassuring to see him finally play. Like he had a little dog in him. I think that dynamite scoring we saw in the first quarter, they, he really needed it. And so did the team just to energize them the rest of the game. It was a little like Mitchell kind of took over in the second quarter. The third quarter was a little weird. DG had a couple of nice drives downhill, but then at the end of the game, he has Suggs on him. Mitchell's calling for the ball. And he says, no, I'm going to take this myself. He gets downhill. And the reason why Wendell Carter Jr. steps up to contest him is because a few times earlier in that half, DG did get downhill. Wendell Carter Jr. stayed home and DG made him pay. And so 
it's not the craziest game from Darius Garland. It's not something that like we should be too happy about. We shouldn't be praising him and and pretending that this isn't anything other than what he should be doing. But I'm still really happy to see it. I think we all are. I think when he's scoring like that, it forces Orlando to adjust a little bit. And so I hope that we get to see more of that. You know, it just felt like the Darius we've seen all season just felt hampered and you felt like he was refined or uh, restricted to only shooting and being a threat from the perimeter and seeing him actually find success in a physical defense in Orlando to get to the rim and attack effectively was something we really haven't seen since he broke his jaw, like towards the beginning of the season, just him willing to kind of take that contact and then the aggression resulting in something that actually affects the defense throughout the whole game. I mean, Mitchell also seems pretty hampered while trying to get to the rim as well. So the Cavs are really missing that slasher that they didn't really have through the first four games. So it's nice to see that Darius can kind of step in and it felt like he was able to uh, caught, like as Tony pointed out, he altered Orlando's defensive mindset various times in the second half. And that wouldn't have happened if Darius didn't have the first (laughs) quarter that he did. I think, one of the problems that Darius falls into is he tries to like set up his bigs too much. And I feel like that just takes him almost out of the flow of the game in a, in a way and has him like reacting instead of making the the defense react to him. And I think that was kind of the difference in the first quarter. And that's Mm -hmm. what, that's what you want to see from him. That's how you want to see him play. So, you know, I, and you like, you saw why he's so important because when he's out there doing his thing, it's really hard to stop this team because you can't just sell out to, you know, take the ball away from him. Like we saw, we talked earlier when he had that really good first quarter against the Suns, Mm -hmm. how after the game they were like, yeah, we just denied the ball and there was nothing else they could do because there was no Donovan Mitchell. But when they have Donovan Mitchell, you can't go all out to stop Darius, even if Donovan is playing at this like at this level right now. So this is important and they're not going to win game six. If you know, Darius has 12 points on eight shots, like they're just not going to do that. Yeah, I agree. And so finally let's move into the two game six and talk about it because the Cavs have taken a three, two lead and they have a chance to close the series in Orlando or back home in a game seven, if necessary. So let's keep this one short and sweet. Do any of us trust the Cavs to keep it up and finish the job? No, no, (laughs) <laughs> to, to close the series it doesn't have to be in game six but do you do you trust that they can keep this up oh and, they and can manage to win they the can series? close the series i just like okay. you know so I out don't... in game out in orlando in potentially game seven yeah yeah fair enough Corey, where yeah. are you at yeah i, I second jackson <laughs> <laughs> opinion i mean it would be it would be great if they like it would feel great i don't like i've seen a lot of people say that like this proves something that they were able to win in game five and it it is a big deal, especially without Allen. Like it does mm-hmm. show something, but if they were to go on the road somewhere where they just completely, you know, bombed out in the first two games and just played their brand of basketball, even if it didn't result in a win, but if they just played like Cavs basketball there, I feel like that would be a win in and of itself. And I know in game six of a playoff series, you're not looking mm-hmm. for moral victories, but it's like, I just want this team to show that it has some fight in it when it's Mm. like when the situation isn't ideal. And I feel like they haven't shown that in the postseason. They they didn't show that in the play in against the Nets on the road. They didn't show it at all against the Knicks last year and they didn't show it, you know, this year. So it's like, show us something on the road, please. Yeah, I get what you're saying for sure. I think if they end up closing this series, whether it's in six or seven, I think you can look back at game five and say, okay, they really proved something in that game. That was a big milestone moment. Right now it's kind of pending because obviously if they collapse in game six and they lose in seven, what did game five mean at the end of the right. day? I believe Donovan Mitchell himself, uh, I don't know who asked the question, but they asked him like, what did this prove about the team? And he said, nothing. Uh, we got to do it again in game six. And I'll answer the question once we close out the series. And I agree with him. I think this was a huge milestone moment. I don't want to overlook it in the moment because they're a young team trying to establish themselves. I think they should have been at this point last year. Uh, We've talked about this a few times. They're a year behind schedule. It sucks. It is what it is. Uh, So my answer to this is I do trust them, but I'm fully prepared to be hurt. Like it's my fault for ignoring the red flags. If this one goes wrong, it's on me. I'm choosing to trust them anyway. 
Uh, but in all seriousness, we've seen two versions of this team all year. We've seen both versions show up and not show up in this very series. I think game five was their shining moment of the season so far. So I'm just hoping they can keep pushing forward and the right version of the Cavs shows itself either in six or seven. Yeah, I mean, they played good in game five. So they did a lot of good things. You know, I think JB pressed a lot of the right buttons. So it's like, it's good, but this is what they're supposed to do in a playoff series against a team that they're more skilled than, a team that they, like, when they're at home, like, this was basically a must win. They had to win this game Mm -hmm. because there was, we wouldn't have much faith in them winning game six and seven. So it's like they did what they needed to do. That's great. It would have been a bigger deal if they lost than if they won, if that makes sense. I agree with that. Definitely. Um, I think, I, I think they've shown resilience throughout the year, uh, especially with the never ending wave of injuries uh, that they've dealt with. And this was another example of that stepping up to the plate with Allen injured again. What does it mean if they end up losing this series? Probably not much at all. But right now, in the moment, I want to give them their flowers, give them their credit, and hopefully they manage to close it out. Uh, that's all for this episode of In or Out. A special thank you to everyone who has been watching and supporting. We truly do appreciate it. Let's get this into round two and see what this team is really made of. Uh, with all that being said, go Cavs. I agree. Go Cavs. Brian, am I going to see you on Sunday in Cleveland? <laughs>